12, have you ever stopped to ask yourself, why did Jesus pick 12 disciples? I got a theory for you. Maybe it's because he knew something we need to learn. And that is, not only is it important to have the right people in our life, it's also important to have the right people in the right place. That's right. Everyone in our life has a place. It's our job to put them there. And when something is this consequential, we can't afford to be casual in the way that we manage them. We've got to manage them intelligently. Because listen to me, your greatest joy and your greatest pain will come from the same place, relationships. Our Creator's given us a blueprint. We put it in a book called Relational Intelligence. And I want to help you learn the Creator's way of defining, aligning, and assessing and activating your greatest relationships for your greatest potential, relational intelligence. Amen. All right, so let's go to 2 Samuel chapter number five, verse number one. This is what it says. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, we are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel and you will become their ruler. And when all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a covenant with them before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. This ends the reading of God's word. I want to talk from this subject in our time together. I'm on my way up. Clap your hands if you received that already. I'm on my way up. Ladies and gentlemen, last week we, start a, we started a series of sermons from the series subject, Oil Change. Somebody say, I need some oil. And, and, and the heart behind what I'm attempting to communicate in this series is this. You cannot do spirituality effectively without God. <laughs> All change is an encouragement to shift from self-reliant spirituality to God-reliant spirituality because all of us need some oil. And when I say oil, I am using oil to refer to a word that the Bible calls the anointing. And we define or describe the anointing last week as the appointing, authorizing, and empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. It's when God equips and empowers you and I to be uniquely effective. I mean effective in a way that doesn't come from natural birth, because this is a talent, but effective in a way that only comes from spiritual birth. It's when God gives you an uncommon sense, an unusual IQ, to be uniquely effective in doing whatever he's called you to do. It's you, it's you occupying and operating with a degree of expertise that does not come from natural education that only comes when you get a Ph.D. from G.O.D. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, this is the way the Bible describes it. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, it says, As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you. Somebody say, it's still there. Yeah, I've been through some ups and some downs, but it's still there. I've been through some highs and some lows, but it's still there. I've walked through some gains and some losses, but it's still there. I lost some things on the outside, but I kept something on the inside. It remains in me. It, the, the text says it remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, not counterfeit. No time for fake ones. As it has taught you, remain in him. Now, now watch what John is teaching. John is not saying we don't need people to teach us every now and then. 
God gives people teaching gifts to teach us. God gives teachers to the body of Christ to teach us. What he's saying is not that we don't need people to teach us. What he's saying is there are some things you know that people can't teach. That that only comes from God. That there are some situations and circumstances that you will face that the only answer is God. That there are some conversations God's got to help you have. Somebody can write it down. They can type it up. They can give you advice. But when the rubber meets the road, you need God to work on their heart and get through to them in a way and in a place your words cannot reach. We need the anointing. Is there anybody here that can look back over your life and say, I learned some things and I don't even know who taught me. I know who taught you. God did. And I'm telling you right now, 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 here it is. If we will allow the anointing to be our educator, then it will also become our elevator. If we will allow the anointing to be our educator, it will also become our elevator. Somebody say, I'm on my way up. Yeah, the anointing will give you more than power. It'll give you a promotion if you let it. Let me see if somebody will affirm this for me. This is your year to break barriers, shatter ceilings, and shift seasons. Come on, 1130, and respond like you believe that. Somebody say, this is my year to break barriers, to shatter ceilings, and to shift seasons. Tell somebody, get a good look at me. Because this is the last year I'm going to be like this. I'm on my way up. If you believe that, put praise on that this afternoon. An example of what I'm trying to articulate is in our text. I was reading 2 Samuel chapter 5 and I saw... If I will allow God to teach me some things I can't learn any other way, God can take me some places I couldn't go any other way. If I allow it to be my educator, it'll become my elevator. I see it right in the text. We just read in 2 Samuel chapter number 5, the Bible says that the elders of Israel anointed David as king over Israel at a place called Hebron. But last week, if you were here or you watched it on YouTube, you remember we looked at 1 Samuel chapter 16 where David got anointed by Samuel to be king over Israel. So 2 Samuel 5 is after 1 Samuel 16. That means that David got anointed more than once because new seasons require new oil. Come on. New responsibility requires new oil. I want to let you know that this was not just David's, this was not David's second time being anointed. This was actually David's third time being anointed. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, he got anointed by Samuel. And in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse number 4, I want you to see this. It says, the men of Judah came to David at Hebron, and there they anointed David king over the tribe of Judah. Do you see that? That's the second anointing. And then in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse number 3, we just read it together. It says, the elders of Israel anointed David king over Israel. So you got one anointing in 1 Samuel 16, the second anointing in 2 Samuel 2, and the third anointing in 2 Samuel 5. You see God incrementally advancing David into the office he was anointed for. He was on his way up, but he didn't just go immediately up. God advanced him incrementally. Egypt, wilderness, Canaan. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Outer court, inner court, Holy of Holies. He who is, who was, and who is to come. The same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Did you hear what I just said? You, you see God incrementally advancing him. What's the lesson, church? The season of anointing is not always the season of appointing. 
The season of announcement is not always the season of fulfillment. That God's going to do it, but he's going to do it in steps and in stages. And just because you haven't stepped into all that you've been anointed for doesn't mean God's finished. It might just mean you in your chapter 16 getting ready to go to your 2 Samuel chapter 2. But when it's all said and done, God's going to do exactly what he said he would do. Yeah, he's going to do it. It's just steps and stages. Am I making sense so far? You see, this is what's dope about this. In 1 Samuel 16, David gets anointed to be king, right? And the Bible says, and immediately says, and the spirit of the Lord, 1 Samuel 16, 13 says, and the spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David from that day forward. And Samuel left and went to Ramah. Now, if I'm David, I'm like, you don't put all this oil on my head. I'm sitting here greasy. And then you leave me and I'm in the same place. So I got new oil, but I don't have a new opportunity. You changed my condition, but you hadn't changed my position. I have a king's anointing, but I'm still tending to my daddy's sheep. I got shepherd's responsibility. What do you do when you got oil and an opportunity that don't match? Has anybody ever been secretly and silently frustrated? saying, I know there's more in me than this. I know I've been created for more than this. Come on. Here it is. I want you to see what happens. After David gets anointed, you know where he goes? He goes to the palace, but he doesn't go as king. 1 Samuel 16, 21 says, And David came to Saul and entered into his service, Saul's service. Who's Saul? He's the current king. And Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers, one of the people that carried his armor. And then Saul sent a word to Jesse saying, allow David to remain in my service, for I'm pleased with him. And whenever the spirit from God came upon Saul, David would take up his heart, and he would play it, and then relief would come to Saul, and he would feel better. So here, watch this, David gets anointed to be king, but then he goes in the palace and starts working for the one that is king. He's working for who he's getting ready to replace. Think about the optics of that. Think about how that had to look. Think about how people around here were probably like, you doing what now? Aren't you anointed to be king? You doing what? Come on, let's see if we can contemporize the text. Didn't you, did, didn't you get a degree? You working where? Why'd you go to school four years to do that? He was probably getting shade from others, but he was able, he was able to faithfully steward that season because David probably recognized Saul is school. What they think is beneath me is preparing me. <laughs> because there's no other way David could have learned the ins and outs of the kingdom without getting that access to Saul. So sometimes God will put you underneath a bad boss to train you on how to be a good one when he elevates you. Somebody should pause and praise God right there. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, that he's not exposing you to what he's exposing you to just so you can have insight for no reason. He's giving you insight because elevation is on the way. He's saying, I'm letting you see all of this because I'm getting ready to raise you up. <laughs> Your anointing is going to be an elevator, and when you get there, I need you to have some insight they don't have so that you don't repeat what they have done. I want to know, is there anybody here? that believes God's getting ready to flip, shift some things in your life. Saul is school. And when God takes you to school, you only know you've been cl in class when the class is dismissed. 
That's why he's not responding the way we think he should be responding because we don't see the season the same way. We call it a struggle, and we're waiting on God to fix it. And God's like, this is not a struggle. This is school. It's not 3.30 yet. I'm not letting you out until the bell rings. There's some things you need to learn. There's some things you need to know. And when I take you to where I'm taking you, you're going to be glad you went through it. You're not glad when you're in it, but you're going to be glad when you get out. Can you look back over your life and see some things that were on your nerves when you were in it, but now you thank God that you're on the other side of it because it taught you some things? Are you here? Yeah. It looked like a struggle, Ladarius, but it was school. School in what, Pastor Darius? I thought you say he was anointed. Right. But the anointing is for what we can't do, what we can't learn, what can't be taught, not what we're unwilling to learn. The, the, are you hearing me? The, the, hey, the anointing is God doing what we can't do, not what we won't do. See, the season of announcement is not the season of fulfillment. The anointing and the appointing is not in the same season because God's like, your all is getting ready to take you to some places that are going to require a different set of skills to manage the place. So I need time to develop you so that you don't get to destiny underdeveloped. Because when you get to destiny orally but immature, you damage yourself and you damage others. Are you here? Okay, okay. Here it is. David was anointed to be king, but he had never led anything but sheep. And David had to realize, brother, leading sheep is not like leading people. You're dealing with attitudes and competitiveness and hypersensitivity and jealousy and entitlement. You stump your foot at that sheep, and that sheep going to follow you because it's not a goat. You stump your foot at a human, they're going to stomp back at you. Come on. Yes. See, your oil will take you to some opportunities that require the development of other skills to manage that opportunity effectively. And God's like, let me do this incrementally. Let me give you Judah first, which is just one tribe, before I give you the whole kingdom. Because there's some stuff you don't know that you don't know until you get Judah. You're like, oh, I ain't know this. Yeah, I wanted to be over people. Now I realize they don't do what you say, do they? <laughs> Wait a minute, Wait a minute. I, I, just, I thought grown people would do what you say. They don't do what you say. Listen, I would, love to, <laughs> I, would love, I would love to evaluate David's psalms that were written before he was king. <laughs> Com <laughs> compared to the psalms he wrote after he was king. Before he was king, he was like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. You making me lie down in green pastures. He leave me beside still water. I bet after he was king, he was like Psalms 50. You know, if it if it would have been an enemy that did it, I would have understood it. But it was you, my close brother. We went to church together. I, I bet he wrote, if I had wings like a dove, I'd fly away. I bet he wrote that after he was king. In other words, this contemporary verse, he said, if I could, I'd get in my car and I would leave and I wouldn't call none of y'all. Can we be honest in this church this morning? It can be frustrating, can't it? So God's like, let me give you a little bit. Let me incrementally advance you to give you an opportunity to develop other skills that complement the oil. So while you're on your way up, don't wait. Work. Don't just wait on the elevator. Work while you're on the elevator so that I'm developing what I need to develop to complement the anointing. 
because the anointing is going to take you places that require the development of other skills. I see this with David. I see David's success or lack thereof wasn't just an issue of the anointing. It was the issue of development or the lack thereof in other areas. In three areas, I'm going to share this with you. We're going home. Here it is. Number one, the first area I see David had to develop in was skill. Somebody say skill. He could throw a rock, couldn't he? He could write songs, couldn't he? Yeah, but when you become king, you got to manage a budget. You got to make military decisions. You have to be a military strike. You got to build a team. You got to discover, develop, and then deploy a team. You got to make a decision whether or not you're going to send a woman's son in the war. You got to make a decision whether or not you're going to take a husband out of the home of his wife and send him to war. That requires a different set of skill. Am I making sense? And it seems so non-spiritual, but his oil took him to a place that required the development of other skill. And the willingness to develop that other skill determines how far your oil can take you. If I only want to write songs, I don't need to be a king. If I don't want anything to do with people, I shouldn't be over them. Yes, Holy Spirit. <laughs> right? If I don't want to be bothered, I shouldn't want to be known. If I don't want more to do, I shouldn't want more responsibility. It requires development of a different set of skills. Because I can be a specialist in an area and then that all take me to a position of leadership and it requires a completely different set of skills. That makes sense? I believe there may be some prophetic implications to this because I believe God, for some of us, has been dealing with our heart in this area. He's been like, listen, you got to shift this. You got to turn this. You got to come on, bring more order to your life. Bring more discipline to your life. Stop wasting your time. Learn how to steward that time because I'm getting ready to send some your way that's going to require all that you got and to do it well without losing yourself and losing your mind. You're going to have to be a good steward of your time. He's been telling some of you, come on, Holy Spirit, speak to us. He's been telling some of you, all right, you better, you better start learning how to say no. You say yes to everything, but I'm getting ready to send you into a season where there are going to be too many opportunities for you to say yes to all of them. He's been telling some of you, get clear on who you are and who you not because people are getting ready to pull you in all different types of directions and say you can do this and you can do that and if you don't know what you're supposed to do you're going to be spending time doing what they want you to do and you're going to be doing so much of what they want you to do you aren't going to have time to do what you're supposed to do and then you're going to be mad at them because what you're supposed to do is going to be undone because you're trying to do what they want you to do because you don't know who you are and God's been dealing with some of you saying all right now come on why? He says, because your oil is about to take you to a place that if you don't develop the skill for, you'll fail. Not because you want anoint it, but because this other skill isn't developed. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Number two, <laughs> number two, he had to develop stamina. Stamina. Somebody say stamina. What do I mean by that? This is what I mean by stamina, y'all. Physical, excuse me, I mean, I mean, it can refer to physical. I mean spiritual and emotional endurance. Promotion is pressure. And without stamina, blessings feel like curses. I'm telling you, you better listen to me. To whom much is given, much is required. This is the way the Bible puts it in, in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse number 5. It says, if you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you compete with horses? In other words, if I'm worn out on the level that I'm on with the degree of responsibility that I have, God's saying you are going to break down on this next level because it's horses on this next level. They run further, they run harder, and they run faster. God's like, if I don't have no time with you now, 
I can't give you more to distract you from me. He says, because you're going to need me to manage all this. You're going to need to be prayed up, fasted up, and everything else up. It's pressure. That, that weight and the responsibility of that kingdom. David was like, Lord, when you poured all this oil on my head, you ain't tell me all this. You didn't tell me my sons were going to go crazy. You didn't tell me Joab was going to betray me. You didn't tell me a Ahithophel was going to betray me. You didn't tell me I was going to have to spend my life with a sword underneath my bed because I would be paranoid of all of the fighting I had to do. And without stamina, people don't have the endurance. I'm done, son, to occupy the office. See, we're we having greatness conversations today because greatness is in this room. Greatness is watching this online. This grown folks talk right here. Oh, it's pressure where you're going. It's not just a bigger office. Peace. Peace. If that were the case, anybody could do it. See, here it is. Success is not hard. Being successful at being successful is hard. This is why most people are, that are successful, they're successful, but they're not successful at being successful because that's hard. And it requires stamina. And if we are wore out now, and the only way God develops it is by putting weight on you. The only way you get strength is by weight. That's why he gives you Judah. He says, I'm taking you through these little things to develop the stamina that you need. I'm done. Number three, David needed sauce. Somebody say, I got the sauce. I'm not talking about, some of y'all like, what, marinara, uh, Alfredo? That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> sauce is just a contemporary term. It's, it, it means um, confidence. It's an aura. It's a swag. It's a jazz. It's a vibe. See, the anointing can't be effective if you don't have the confidence to use it. Are you hearing me? David, David said to Goliath, you come at me with a sword and a spear, I come at you in the name of the living God. He had that sauce. Jesus had sauce. When his disciples couldn't cast out a demon, he would say, bring the boy to me. Because this is what I do. Y'all aren't talking. To, we, we, we read it last week in Luke chapter 4. This is how much sauce he has. Jesus goes into the temple, opens up the Bible, and says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to set at liberty those of bruised. And the Bible says he closes the book, sets it on the table, and says, This day, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I'm him. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll bring it back up again. See, sauce is healthy self-awareness. It's not cockiness, but it's confidence. It's an awareness of who I'm not, but also of who I am. And when you don't have sauce, there are problems you can solve, but you'll sit silently while other people wrestle with Goliaths you can knock down because you're waiting on somebody to ask you when sauce makes you volunteer. David was not asked to defeat Goliath. He volunteered. He said, y'all don't hear that man doing all that talking? Y'all scared to fight? He said, this is what he said. I love him. He said, what shall be given to the man? That killer. I say, you get a year's worth of tax. You, you get free taxes and you get the king's daughter. He said, all right, I'll do it. He goes to the king, the king looks at him and says, how are you going to fight that giant? He said, sir, when I was tending to my daddy's sheep, a lion and a bear came to devour the sheep, and I killed them both with my bare hands. And the same God that delivered me 
from the hand of the lion and the bear shall deliver me from this Philistine. I got the sauce. And Saul said, okay, at least let me give you my armor and my weapons. And he tried them on. He said, no, no, no. This is not my style. This is what you need. I don't even need all that. You just give me a rock and a slingshot. And I'm going to knock this giant down because I got the sauce. And there are problems waiting to be solved on you, by you. But they won't be solved if you're sitting on your sauce. You know, we're going to be sending something out to you this week just to let you know all the things our church is doing with the coronavirus, etc. But, but the reason we're able to do that is because one of our members, one of the doctors in our church, he texted me this week. He said, Pastor, um, I see everything that's going on with the virus or whatever. He says, but you do know this is what I do. See, y'all missed that. I want you to get to the place in your life that when a problem break out, you say, that's all on me for that. That's, that's why I was born. I got the sauce. This is what I do. He didn't wait for me to message him. Because when you got the sauce, you volunteer. And there are problems waiting to be solved by people like you and me who are willing to use their oil. You're not cocky. Don't worry about being seen like them. You're not them. And people that can discern your heart know you're not them. They know you're not trying to be controlling. Some people are trying to be controlling and they take over. But people who have discernment and wherewithal, they know you aren't like that. Don't let a problem exist in your home, in your church, in your community that you could solve. And not say, let me kill that giant for you. Because I got the sauce. Father, I pray that you would deliver us from the spirit of fear and timidity and apprehension, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, and I pray that you give us a boldness that rises on the inside of us to use the oil you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Clap your hands, family. I feel the Holy Ghost. Somebody, somebody praise him right here. The devil's mad. We're getting ready to loose some Davids in this world. Come on, you're getting ready to sling your rock and not giants down. Give him praise. Hey. <laughs>